are listening to Survive the Hunt. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Survive the Hunt, episode number four. I'm Jake Hacker. I'm one of your hosts, your other host, Mr. Billy Hoffman on the other side. What's up, Billy? Hey, what's going on, Mr. Hacker? You having a good night tonight? I'm doing good, man. What'd you do this week? Oh, it's, uh, I had a little bit of a vacation from work. So, and actually this week I went back to work. So four, four, four night shifts in a row. Uh, I'm happy to be off. I got a good little stretch here off, uh, shot my bow today. So that was nice. Going to move, nice. going to move some trail cameras around for those of you, you know, I know not everyone listens to these right away or, or they find us, uh, you know, further down their journey. Uh, right now, it's it's the what is it, second week of July. So yeah. you know, there's not a whole lot of ton going on in the outdoor world aside from catching bluegills and catching bass and moving trail cameras around. Yep. So how about you? Yep. Yeah, no, some of the same. I got got a big shipment of cameras in this week, and we got a new farm I'm looking at. So uh, for some, bring some hunters on. So I'm excited for that. Um, I've been working with some new tools this week, though, man. I. Uh, I don't know if you saw my Facebook page. I got that settler's wrench. Have you seen that? Uh, that it's um, yeah, I did see that. Uh, I think I originally saw that on the TV show alone, right? Uh, yeah. What Sean Sean okay. um on the first episode? He's actually the guy who made it. Oh, I didn't. I didn't um, realize it, it was actually there was a connection there. Yeah, it's like it's his invention. So I think that's one of the reasons he took it on there. Um, but I ordered one. So the reason I ordered it. So I've been teaching. Uh, primary skills, wilderness classes and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, walkabout classes, things like that. Well, I've added in teaching or doing like corporate team building retreats, okay. like weekend getaways. I'll go up to whatever location the company wants to go in. And the the big difference between the corporate retreats and the one-on-one survival classes is they right. want to have swag. They want to have swag. Oh, afterwards. okay. So my favorite thing to give them is, is a more knife or swag. something like that. Stuff we yes. all get. Swag. Stuff we all get. <laughs> This is two episodes in a row with an office reference. All right, I'm just going to drop the ball right here. We're going to make a lot of office references forever. There's going to be a lot of them. Forever yep. because never uh, going anywhere. Swag, and then automatically I started thinking like walking across the bed of coals. With, with I saw you laughing the whole time. I, yeah. I was picturing Andy floating away in the sumo suit. You know? <laughs> like, there's like, there's... <laughs> anyway. Um... <laughs> anyway, so usually I would recommend that we give them like a knife and a pair of cord and a pair of rods, something like that. Right. Yeah. For some reason, big companies don't like to give their employees knives. Well, makes sense. Yeah. Doesn't right. doesn't make sense, but I understand it. Yeah, I get it. So I've been looking for some new items that I can uh, work into my classes that corporations still like to give out and that I think is a really cool, useful tool. So I got this. Uh, got the seller's wrench and been playing with it all week. It's pretty cool, man. It's uh, so basically what it is, it's a scotch eyed auger for anybody to know what a scotch eyed auger is. It's like a one inch drill bit that you power by hand. And at the top of the drill bit, it's got a place where you can stick a stick in there and use it to get some leverage. So you can power through and you can bore a one inch hole. Um, I, I think with this one, it's like four and a half, five inches. You can bore through one side with this auger. And then what really sets this uh, seller's wrench apart from a normal scotch eye auger is it's got a tapered end on one end of the eye. So you can set that on your, your stick or a log or something and pound on it with a mallet or a piece of wood, and it oh, makes a peg. Oh, okay. And, yeah, the peg fits perfectly into the, into the hole you bore. So you can really put stuff together. And if you, what, what I was working on this week was actually boring all the way through something, putting that peg in and then driving a wedge in the other side like you do in an axe head. Um, and just seeing the security of that, dude, it's impressive. I'm really happy with that. So it's it's definitely going up for consideration for the uh, for the team building stuff where I can't give away knives. It might even go into my uh, into my one on one and and uh, normal bushcraft classes. Yeah, no, I I don't see why it wouldn't, especially if you're going to be building stuff for an extended stay. Yep. You know, um, we're not talking about wrapping yourself up in a tarp and trying to make it through the night to you get rescued right. or whatnot. We're right. talking about actual uh, usefulness. It seems to me, though, like it has uh, some uses even outside of like the survival world. Like you could do. I could. I cool could see myself it. using it around the house. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. I build a lot of stuff 
Um, it's funny because like last week we were talking about how I was like, I've never really built a shelter, you know, and yeah. I, was, I was talking to my wife about that and she's like, yeah, but you built the chicken coop and you built the arch and you built like all this other stuff that I've built like out of survival type materials, like natural materials. And then I was like, yeah, and I've probably built, I don't know, two, three hundred natural blinds over the, yeah. so I'm like, oh yeah, if I added a roof, I just made a I, just I guess I shell. have done that. Yeah. So yeah. I, ne- I never really thought about that, you know, and those are mostly <laughs> like A-frame type stuff. So, you know, yep. n- but um, well, you can see even using uh, that uh, that tool you're talking about to build like a really cool deer hunting blind, like root with like natural yeah. wood and stuff like that and really put it something that will yep. last for years. It'd be really neat. Yep. Did I ever tell you about the – this is not what we're talking about today, guys, but did I ever tell you about the, the, um, the blind I built in Africa that the elephant killed? Uh, I don't think I've heard that story. I, I know. Okay. Uh, yeah. The only elephant story I heard is the, the one where you guys darted it and it tracked you. Well, I don't. Okay. Spoiler alert. We're not, we're going to tell, we're going to do Jake Africa stories. Okay. Because well, well, nothing yeah. gets me more excited than Jake Africa <laughs> stories. So much so that like, I beg him to tell him all the time, but, uh, if he's getting ready to tell us one, I'm going to shut up so that he'll will. All right. I'm going to tell you one. So. So for those of you who don't know, I spent an extended uh, amount of time in Africa. My senior year of high school, I worked uh, as an, an apprentice professional hunter there in Africa, uh, which basically is a glorified coffee boy. You, you run and get coffee and tea for everybody, and you prove your salt, and then after a while, you get to do some cool stuff. So um, one of the jobs I got assigned to, we were actually lion hunting, um, and they put me on blind building. So I went in this area, there's like a little pond or a bunch of lion tracks there. And dude, I spent a full like 16 hour day in the African heat building this blind out of Mapani and all kinds of like, like baobab uh, limbs and stuff that had fallen down, weaving in branches. Dude, it was glorious. You could fit two guys and a cameraman in there. Like no problem. It had 360 degree shooting almost like it was gorgeous. Like I, I wish I had a picture of it. It was so cool. So I built this blind and I went back and told the PH, I said, Hey, I got that blind set. we got a bait set there. There's been a line hitting it almost every night. I think we need to go hunt that the next day. He's like, all right, cool. We'll go in there and hunt it. So the next morning, me and him and, and the guy who was there hunting, we go in there, we got the cameraman with us. And my job was going to be to sit on the outside of this blind while we're lion hunting. And the hunter, the PH and the cameraman were on the inside. So hindsight, I wish I would have built it a little bit bigger than I did because outside of a lion blind, it's not where you want to be. But it didn't matter because when we got there, uh, we found where an elephant had completely destroyed all my hard work. Uh. Never even got to spend one minute inside of it. It was I was so proud of it too. Still to this day, it's probably the best hunting blind I've ever built. Do you so because you know elephant um, behavior way better than I do? Do you, yeah. yeah, but I know how intelligent they are. Do you think that? He knew what he was doing, or was he just being hundred percent a bull in a china shop and bumping into stuff randomly? No doubt, he knew it. He he, he probably came it apart in there because it was unnatural to him. Yeah, he probably came in there to get a drink out of that water hole and smelled me, or just just realized that something was wrong there. He didn't like it in his house, so he just went over and I don't know if he stepped on it, smashed it. He had pooped all over it. There were tracks all over. <sighs> I mean, he just completely destroyed. Not an inch of it was usable. Did you guys have any bait hanging in the tree and everything already or no? There was there was actually a water buck, uh, which which I had found like three or four days earlier um, that a line was on. I actually saw the line on the dead water buck carcass. And we took that water buck and tied it up to a tree uh, so the line couldn't drag it off. So we had a carcass there that was an actual lion kill we were hunting over. It was a killer spot. I mean, just it's an awesome spot we were hunting. Uh, did you ever go back and rebuild or anything or that particular we, spot? So we threw a pop-up blind up there actually – um, and this was like, that's what I want to be in when there's a 700 pound line in front of me. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm with you, but I, honestly, I, the, the, the Mapani blind's not stopping anything either. That's uh, what the gun's there for. I don't but, know if they're 700 pounds. I just made a number up. That seems big. Yeah, that's a little big, but uh, it's a big animal. Though. Uh, but no, we did hunt it. We sat in a pop-up line. Um, I actually got to go with them that day when they were hunting. So it was, there was no cameraman in there. Uh, but it was me, the hunter, and the PH, and the blind was so small, I actually had to lay down on the ground. So I was laying down on the sand, just listening. Like, I was just so excited to be there, dude. Like, dude, I'm in Africa on a lion hunt. It's day three. Like, I just want to see a lion. Um, so we get there, and I hear the PH go, okay, here he comes. You know, this is a big lion. Get ready. And the hunter was was not – he was probably the worst hunter I've ever hunted with. 
Um, he just had a lot of money and he was in Africa to have a good time. And I appreciate that, but it was dangerous to be hunting with this guy for, we'll, we'll get into those stories another time. But, uh, the time the lion came in, it was on the, on the water buck bait. Um, and the guides got some, some film of it. Uh, but the hunter looks over at the pH and he goes, Hey, should I put a bullet in my gun now? Uh. So, yeah. So we, we sat there that whole time, the whole night, no bullet in this hunter's gun, the pH, you know, he's got his H and H. You right, know, 460 nitro double rifle. But yeah, the hunter wasn't ready. So he threw a round in there. And by the time he threw a round in, that line was long gone. Oh, hearing yeah. clicking and clanking. So that was day, it was either three or four. We sat in that blind and it was day 23. We actually killed the lion. So we had our shot there and it took 20 more days to get it done. Jeez, oh, Pete. Well, Yikes! That was so that we're. This is a new segment we're gonna do on every show. Is an Africa story. No, I'm just kidding. Oh my goodness! <laughs> but uh, uh, speaking of uh, cats in the wild and wild cats, uh, two weeks ago uh, we talked about the Everett Wildcats because I have the, the Tumblr right here, right? I was gonna bring it up if you didn't go here, so I'm glad you did. Everett Wildcats, the Tumblr. I did their um, their uh, career day. Right. I've done it a couple of times now. Uh, And they sent me this great tumbler. It's what what I'm drinking my cocktail out of tonight. Well, uh, they saw that. And I am. Oh, yeah. yeah, They saw it. uh, And I'm now rocking. Everett Wildcats t-shirt they sent me. Everett Wildcats, you're my new favorite team in all of Michigan. So so here's here's what we got going. If okay. your high school <laughs> wants to wants to sponsor this show, this is how cheap I am. Send me a t-shirt, and I will wear your t-shirt on an episode. Uh, it's P.O. Box 76, Fenton, Michigan, F-E-N-T-O-N, 48430. And don't worry, you don't have to write that down. It'll be in all the things below. But uh, So P.O. Box 76, Fenton, Michigan, 48430. If you send me a t-shirt... As long as it's supporting schools or or your favorite sports team or something like that that's that's not you know in poor taste, uh, we'll we'll rock it for you and we'll we'll, we'll just mention uh, where I'm wearing. I, I think that's kind of be a fun thing. Maybe people all over the United States or the world will send me a T-shirt, and this is just another way for me to get free stuff. That's yeah, that's what it boils down to. <laughs> no, but thank you, thank you for the T-shirt. Everett Wildcats. That's cool. I like that. It's good colors. You guys are well. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> but what are we going to talk about tonight, man? We will. I tell tonight. you what. Tonight. Hold on. We started okay, talking ahead. about Africa. We started talking about hunting. Let's do something hunting. What are we going to do? Let's talk about broadheads tonight, Billy. Right, so Billy and I have a long running debate about broadheads. We've never had this in person because I'm not sure we'll be friends afterwards. <laughs> we've only social media bashed each other about this before so we're going to talk about broadheads fixed blade Can't. versus expandable what's the no we're not talking about expandables when? at all we're only talking about fixed blades because this is the only anyway go ahead ha- half the show is mine so we're going to spend half of it talking about <laughs> cannabis <laughs> no we're going to talk about broadheads different scenarios and situations i think i might have some opinions that actually surprise you a little bit Maybe some things that you like that we haven't discussed before. Probably not because you're not going to like most of what I have to say. But we'll see where it goes. So let's start out with let's start out with what kind of bows we're shooting. What what okay. kind of bow, bows do you use? Because this, so, makes, this makes a big difference in the. It right, makes a so. gigantic difference. Yeah. Um, so I do shoot a compound bow uh, okay. as well as I have hunted with a recurve, and I also hunt with a longbow. Okay. Um, for me, uh, bows are like guns. I want them all. I want to shoot them all. And thankfully, my wife can't tell the difference between them. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's but, not listening to this, so who cares? No, yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but, but honestly, uh, I, I generally pick a bow for the season. Okay. It's so like, oh, this is going to be a recurve year. This year, I'm going to hunt with my long bow. This year, I'm going to hunt with my compound. And I do that just to make sure I'm proficient in the weapon I'm carrying a field. Now, yeah. it also depends on the game I'm chasing. Because if I'm going out, if I'm going to go after small game or something like that, I'm going to take a longbow versus, versus a compound. Um, or, or, or I should say, you know, to me, longbows and recurves, traditional bow, 
uh, you know, just call it a trad bow. Um, which one I grab is flavor of the day. They all shoot the same for me. Um, it's, uh, it, it just, it is what it is as far yeah, as I think goes. for the purpose of this particular topic, we can lump recurves, longbows, trads all together. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, so, but, um, it, it, last year was a longbow year. Okay. And, uh, I did harvest a deer last year. Uh, but I also, I also think I, I don't know if I called you or Jason Sam Koviak first, but. I lost a 150 plus inch buck. Didn't lose it. I didn't. I didn't get the opportunity to shoot it because I had a longbow in my hand. Okay. Uh, he he was at 34 yards. That's a shot I will take all day long with a compound. Oh it's yeah. A shot. It's a shot I would never even dream. Of. If he's at, I would never dream of taking it with a trad bow. If he's at 35 yards, he might as well be at 500 yards. Doesn't yep. matter. He's not within. Again, this is ethical hunting. This is not like a survival situation. Right. right. So uh, if it's if I'm hungry and that's what I got to eat, I'm flinging arrows. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know that that's not the situation we're in. So um, so so this year, and it's not all about the kill. A lot of um, my friend Jason Samkoviak, who hosts the traditional bow hunting and wilderness survival podcast, he actually put out a T-shirt. It's a great T-shirt. It's a silhouette of him shooting a longbow, and it says, "The how matters." Yeah. And I get it. I totally get it. The how does matter, and it matters to me a lot too. Um, what also matters to me is putting venison in the freezer. And um, while I am a good shot with a trad bow, I'm not a super accomplished hunter with one as of yet. I've had some success, but I can see myself this year. My plan this year, of course, it's July, but my plan this year is to shoot the compound, um, maybe get one or two in the freezer, and then switch to the longbow. Okay. Um, mainly because I, I like to hunt with both. I really do. Yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy precision of compounds and I enjoy the, the, um, uh, the more pure hunting with, with the trad bow. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So for me, when it comes to what kind of bows I'm using and what broadheads I'm using, those two are where it's at for me. It's either going to be a trad bow or a compound. Now, um, what about you? So uh, I'm actually kind of the other way, like the how does matter, but it matters to me to a certain point. So I put myself more in the trophy hunter category, like for okay. all my wilderness survival stuff that I do, I like to shoot deer with big antlers on them. And I've killed enough deer with big antlers with my compound bow that like, I kind of don't care if I kill with compound bow, or if I kill it with a shotgun or a rifle or a muzzleloader or a crossbow. Last year, I hunted almost exclusively with a crossbow. My shoulder, I've got a bad back from 10 years working as a cop. My back and my shoulder, dude, it just killed me last year. And I could power through it. Like, I could draw my bow back. There's, I'm not, not saying I couldn't draw my compound bow. I had right. fun, fun hunt with a crossbow last year. It was fun to be able to shoot 40 yards and not worry about what I was doing. So last year, I hunted mostly with a crossbow. This year, um, I'm going like hardcore primitive. I've got a hunt in Nebraska. I'm doing with an addle addle because that is a, it's a legal weapon in that state. So that's like as far as you can get away from the Raven R26, like you know, twenty five hundred dollar crossbow. What, what a swing! You're going yeah, from dude, a it's, Raven it's a, to to throw in darts. To throw in darts with with hand with mapped stone. Yeah, yeah. So like I'm Wait, napping, oh really? You're gonna I'm napping my own head. heads. Everything I, I've made. Maybe the owl, owl I kind of like it. I think I'm going to make another you, one. Man. That's yeah, amazing. So, so, like, I'm going hardcore the other way. But I've also got someone making me a really nice primitive bow. I mean, real actual primitive. And he's making me some matched arrows and matched broadheads and everything. You know, the guy's a pro. Flint napping is kind of a new thing for me. Yeah. I'm starting to get where I can make what I mean to make most of the time. But, it, dude, it's tough. Like, it's been a hard skill to learn. So yeah, for it's me, not, it's not, I've done it. It's not easy. Yeah. So this, this year I'll hunt, I've got a deer hunt in Kansas. I'm going to do it with my 300 PRC super long range rifle that I can shoot a thousand yards with and hit a plate. Um, I'm going to hunt Ohio probably with my Raven R26 most of the time. I'm going to hunt Nebraska with an addle addle. And I've got a hunt in Minnesota that I plan to do with that primitive bow. So like I'm kind of all over the map. I'll use my compound in Kentucky when I hunt there too. So at least five different weapons I'll hunt deer with in five different states this year that's really that's really cool um so it, nebraska's legal to use an ad huh 
Yeah, I think it's Nebraska, and I think Alabama might be the other one. I think there's only two states in the U.S. where it's illegal to hunt deer with an atlatl. I can't imagine Texas would – I mean, you can blow them up with dynamite in Texas. Well, yeah, Texas is, is – I kind of don't even include Texas as like a state when it comes to hunting because everything it's, down there is I mean, private ground. Private, yeah. Most of it's it, yeah. most of it's fenced, you know, where you can do that stuff. But I'm not even sure in Texas. So if you're hunting free range white tail deer, I don't know if that allows legal. Yeah, I, I mean, would. You know, uh, have, I'd have to look have into it. Free range white tail deer. Sorry, Texas. I know we're pooping on you a little bit, but that's just nah, it's, the, right. it's the culture down there. So, <laughs> all right. Still though, we haven't we we haven't really talked about broadheads. So. Um, one thing yep. Jake said, he asked me, like, because it was important to know mm -hmm. what type of bow I was shooting. But I think where you were going with that is what type of broadhead do I use for each bow? Um, is that what kind of where you were? Yeah, that's where I was going because it matters what, like, for me, I've got my broadheads that I like to shoot for 90% of the stuff I hunt. But depending on the weapon and depending on the game species, I will switch it up a little bit. Um, and go to something, you know, I already said, I'm going to be shooting some stone points this year. So you can't get more traditional than that, but I also like my mechanicals. So that, that's why, that's why I broke it down for weapon. And then maybe we'll get into a little bit for species, but let's just stick to deer for now. White tail okay. deer, you know, the normal, that's what most people listen to this are going to be hunting. So let's stick to white tail deer. Let's start with your recurve. What, what broadheads are you shooting with your recurve? So one thing you said is break it down by species. There is no breaking it down by species. It doesn't matter. Okay. If you build, if you build an arrow that's going to kill the biggest, baddest thing you're going to hunt in North America, it sure as heck is going to kill a white-tailed deer. So why would you even switch? Well, the answer to that for me is really going to get into detail in this conversation because for me, I've got I will just get right to what I like to shoot out of my Raven crossbow or out of my compound bow. I like. Well, to I, shoot. Did, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to jump ahead. I didn't mean to well, jump ahead. I mean, if you, know, want me answer the, if you want me to answer the question, not ask me a question. That was no, you can ask I, a question. That's fine. We'll just, we'll go, we'll go the way we're going. Cause for me, I like to shoot rage hypodermic. Like that is my favorite broadhead. I'd kill dozens and dozens of animals with it. I've never had a problem with it. I really like it, but I don't think I would use those on something like a bison. I don't know that I would use them on an elk like because the blade, like there is some, some breakability and some bendability in those blades. I'm not worried about it at all on a white tail or, or a black bear or a mule deer or an antelope or anything like that. But in a thicker skinned animal, I'm familiar enough with their skin and their bones where I may start leaning toward a fixed head because of penetration. That's okay. why, I, that's why I phrase it like that. Uh, okay. I, I, I guess I get that from, from the mechanical standpoint, and I'm glad to hear that you're not just put a rage in the cage no matter what. I, I like to hear it. I, I, I'm yeah. happy to hear that. Um, okay, so you asked me what I would shoot out of a trad bow. Yep. And uh, so for me, I actually have some arrows here. And let me – oh, I just dropped one, so we'll get that in a minute. But uh, – <laughs> One thing that is uh, important for me when picking broadheads is um, uh, obviously we've already kind of talked. I like uh, fixed blade, yep. but there's a difference between fixed blade and cut on contact. Okay. Um, for example, if you're familiar with like a muzzy head for you guys, that would be a, a fixed blade, but not, not necessarily a cut on contact because it's got like their, their tanto tip. So, which means it's going to punch first and then cut its way through the animal. Uh, I prefer to get rid of all that punch, okay? And, and um, people say, well, you know, what if you hit a bone, blah, 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 blah. We don't have to worry about that if you use heavy broadheads and heavy front of center, FOC. Um, so my, fa my favorite over the last couple of years has been a two-blade VPA head. VPA stands for Vantage Point Archery. I'm just holding this up to the camera right now. This is a two blade head. Uh, this is a double bevel head, which means there's it's sharpened on both sides. Uh, we can talk single double bevel um, if you want, but this uh, this is the VPA. I think they call it the Terminator, but you can just look up Vantage yeah, Point it's Archery. It's a good looking broadhead, though. Yeah. No, it, it's it's real solid. If you look at the point. It's not super pointy. It's not, right. it doesn't come directly to a sharp, sharp point. Uh, kind of like you might see on like an older style of Zawicki or even like uh, stock Fred Bear heads. And the reason I don't like that point, this is a little blunter, um, but it still cuts right away, 
is for that reason. If you're hitting bone or something, if it's, you got a needle needle point that can curl when it hits bone. With this, it's just gonna, it's gonna either go through the bone or it's going to slice its way around it. Now that particular head, that VPA head, is 175 grains, which is pretty heavy, but not yeah. crazy heavy because you have a lot of guys shooting trad gear that are, are shooting uh, up 250, 275. I mean, you can go crazy. Like the iron wheel broadheads and stuff are like four or 500, 600 grains. Um, you really got to work with your spine on your shaft and spine down. If you're doing stuff like that, that's a, that's a conversation for another day. T today, we're just talking about heads. But I think it's important when we talk about heads to also talk about the construction of the arrow itself. This, um, this insert right here that you see in the arrow, a lot of times, if you're just going to your pro shops, the stock insert they're going to sell you is aluminum mm -hmm. and it's going to weigh about 11 to 12 grains. That insert is a hundred grain insert. Okay, so that makes that 175 grain head, that makes it 275 grains up front. That's very heavy. Some people say, why, why, why go so heavy? And across the board, even when we start talking about my compound setup, you're gonna see that I'm heavy up front. And this is the best way I can explain it to you. A golf ball and a ping pong ball are relatively the same size, right? But if, if they're both flying, at 100 miles an hour, which one is going to penetrate deeper into a snowbank? Obviously, it's going to be the golf ball because it's got more mass, it's got more momentum. It's the same concept, okay? Um, momentum is what creates penetration. It's not kinetic energy. <laughs> Can we it's, all agree kinetic energy is garbage? Well, no, I, I, in regards to archery, yes. um, th there are some times when you need certain kinetic energy with mechanicals. You need kinetic energy to open that mechanical. Okay. okay. Kinetic energy is, is, the, is, the, is the impact. It's, kinetic energy is how a bullet kills, right? It's the shot wave. It's the impact. The laceration and the hemorrhaging that a bullet kills is secondary. The, right. hem the, the shock and the impact. Where an arrow is the exact opposite. Arrows create lethality because of hemorrhaging, because of bleeding, right? So th they don't need a – a cut in contact doesn't need uh, kinetic energy. Now, when you calculate kinetic energy, one of the things that has a big value on it is momentum. So they go right. hand in hand, but momentum is where it's at, and momentum comes from weight. And the reason you don't just want a heavy arrow, you want a heavy front end of the arrow, is because you want the – front end driving the car or driving the arrow versus the weight on the back think about it this way we've all um we, we've all hit we've all put nails in wood right right so if you get it started and you tap it and then you hit it from the back a lot of times unless you're real skilled and, and have it perfectly lined up what happens the nail goes sideways you bend it right that's because all the weight and all the pressure is coming from the back what that's going to do if if it's if there's not heavy up front is you get all this flex and it's pushing, it's mm -hmm. pushing the back. You don't want it pushing the back. You want it pulling from the front. Okay. And that's going to pull itself through the animal. So we, you asked what I use for my, my trad bows. This is my preferred broadhead on trad bows okay. is a two blade VPA. I think they call it the terminator. Again, this is 175 grains with a hundred grain insert. What's the, so, what's, what's the cutting diameter? I believe that one's an inch and a half. Okay. Um, now, there is some people that will tell you, um, like if you look up um, uh, Dr. Ashby. Dr. Ashby was a professional hunter in Africa. He's, he's, he is literally the reason why bow hunting is legal in Africa. He was hired by the South African government to go over there. And I'm... I, I might be fogging on some of these details, but to go over there and study, um, they would shoot, you know, they would take a, like a rhino kill or uh, any, any kind of kill, wildebeest, and they would sh just plunk arrows into it, just figuring out what the best combination was. And what he, and basically when it comes to trad guys, what he said is generally the Bible, and that's a three to one ratio, which means is it's three times as long as it is wide. 
three okay. to one, right? And um, and you, you'll see that all in a lot of trad broadheads, especially if you look at like the Tough Head, um, Iron Will, there's, there's just a bunch of brands, right? Uh, those all carry that three to one because of what Ashby said. This broadhead right here is not three to one. I understand that it's not three to one, but it works for me. You know, it's probably mm -hmm. two and three quarters to one. So it's, it's along those lines yeah. of, of, of what he suggested. But um, the VPA Terminator is my, in two blade, not three blade, in two blade is my preferred broadhead for traditional shooting. Okay. Doesn't mean there's not other good ones. It just means uh, I like this. Now, I mentioned single bevel versus double bevel. We'll just talk about that real quick. Um, okay. Double bevel means is like your kitchen knives. Double bevel, the the and, and for those of you on, on uh, YouTube, you can actually see the video. Double bevel means both of my hands are sharpened, right? It comes right. to a point. It's just like it's just like the fillet knife in your kitchen, shaped like a pyramid. Yeah, perfect example. Right. Yeah, perfect example. Right. And a single bevel is going to be um, shaped like a uh, almost like like a wedge that you would use for cutting wood or something. But it's gonna uh, pick, picture like a plane wing. Okay, a plane wing. And only the top edge is sharpened. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. And then on the other side, on the other blade, the opposite side is sharpened. And the reason <clears throat> for that is that will actually, uh, when it gets, now they're both extremely deadly, right? Single yeah. bevel, single bevel will give you better penetration. The reason it will is because it creates an S wound channel. So when it, it's spinning, when it comes into right. um, and it goes through the animal, of course, a double bevel broadhead. Of course, the arrow is spinning; it's just naturally going to do that. But when it hits the animal, it's going to stop spinning and slice through. Where a single bevel will keep spinning all the way through that animal, right. because of because of the way the blades cut, and that does it. It does help with penetration. The downside is there; they can be a pain in the ass to sharpen. Yeah. So a lot of people um, stay away from them. However, if you're going to go shoot, if you're going to Africa and you're going to, you know, do Asiatic water buffalo, or you're going to Australia and you're going after, um, yeah, you're... you know, the, the big stuff like that, uh, definitely. Or if you're shooting like lower poundage and you want to get, you're worried about your penetration, definitely something to consider. But when it comes to most um, trad stuff, this is the broadhead. Now, this broadhead right here actually um, is 175 grains. This is the same broadhead that my daughter killed her turkey with this year. That's cool. Out of her, out yeah. of her twenty, out of her 27 pound bow, That's she crazy. shot him right above the legs, and it was a complete pass through. That's cool. So, for those of you guys that watch the outdoor channel and you see guys sticking turkeys and they don't get pass throughs, my daughter did, and she's 11 years old. <laughs> You know, because we build heavy arrows for penetration. All right. Yep. Sorry, I went on a little bit of rant there, but um, it's all right. That, it's okay. I expected it. This is something that I am somewhat passionate about. I kind of geek out on stuff like this, right? Couldn't, couldn't tell at all. Yeah, right. So let, let me grab this other arrow real quick. And okay. um, so you talked about with your um, addle that you're, you're going to be stone chipping or chipping some flint or making stone broadheads. Do you have any other broadheads that you plan on using for, nope. or like, what, what do you use? What have you used in the past when you've shot your, uh, trad bows? Uh, so I am not a very experienced trad bow guy. Like I, I don't, I don't pretend to be or try to be. So I've shot the, the dirt nap heads. I think it's a DRT. I've shot that. That's what I've always shot out of my, my recurve. Yeah. That one right there. Same right one. here. For, so for yeah. those of you watching, this is a uh, dirt nap gear. This is the DRT, which stands for dead right there. Uh, and this is, this is a great head. These heads, um, uh, I I've killed a couple deer with, with this exact head with my compound. Right. Uh, the only reason I would absolutely have no problems whatsoever using this head out of a trad bow as well. The only reason I don't is because this head come, this particular head is 125 grains. So yep. it's 50, it's 50 grains shy of, you know, what I want to shoot out of a trad bow. That being said, a lot of people shoot this out of trad bows. The other thing is that 50 grains wouldn't make that big of a deal if I just got a heavier insert. Right. Yeah. So I will I say that that is something I did on my, on my, my, uh, trad arrows. I do have a 50 grain insert. 
in there. Yeah, well, right. Well, I have a hundred grain insert in this, but I'm saying if I, if I went to, um, if I wanted to get up to that, I like to have a right around 300 grains up front. Okay. Generally. Right. So if I went to a heavier insert, I could go with a lighter broadhead. Gotcha. Right. Um, yep. so yep. Th- yeah, so that is, that, that's the DRT. These were, these are, are really good heads. Uh, the owner of the company, Tom Adelman, great guy. I, I've, I've met him, I met him this year at ATA for the first time in person, but I've kind of worked with, not worked with him, but I've had him on previous podcasts and stuff. They're a hilarious company as a comedian. I, I really like them. They're a great um, co- follow on social media. Oh, they're, they're fantastic. Yeah. This is a, uh, a four blade, but let, let's, let's, before we start going there, it's it at its core, it's a two blade cut on contact, right? right. Uh, which is double bevel. Okay. However, it does have two smaller. Um, I think they're, I don't know what size they are. Maybe another half inch uh, bleeder blades. And it just, cr- just creates a really nasty wound inside an animal that doesn't, that the problem a lot of times with the two blade is the skin flap can close and you can have decreased blood trails. So that's one of the things with the two blade that you, you sacrifice penetration for a big gaping hole. Right. Whereas this thing, this, you hit it with this, it's not going to plug up. One of the other things I like about the DRT is uh, this uh, particular um, head is this back right here, this back edge that's sharpened. Yeah. Okay, so if you don't get a complete pass through, like you lodge it in the back shoulder or something, yeah, it's still that is slicing just, around in there. There's it's bouncing around in there. Yeah. It's cutting, cutting, you know, arteries. It's cutting blood vessels and all that. The the DRT also they um they do make a 150 grain uh um option now, so they make a heavier one. I just haven't cool. bought them yet. Um, gotcha. It's, it's called I believe it's called the Alpha. Okay. Um, but the cool thing about this um which to me is not all that cool because uh, I would never shoot this light of a broadhead, but on this broadhead itself, it does have a removable collar for you guys that are looking this right here. This collar right here is a 25 grain. I'm sorry. Yeah. 25 grain collar. So if you wanted a hundred grain head versus 125 grain head, you could buy, it's all one, it's all one package, one skew as they call it. Right. Yep. So you, you, and why would you go down to a hundred grain? I don't know. Right. I mean, I know why guys want to do that because they think speed kills and that's a, that's a little bit of fancy marketing there. Um, but if you're buying this head, you should be running that collar on there. You should be running all 125 greens. Yeah. I will kill stuff with this head this year. Um, and I I've run this on my compound. Um, again, I run the, the, the heavier 175 grain head on out of my trad bows. I, I also have a quiver full of the dirt nap DRTs that I will run on my compound. So it, it's a really good, excellent choice um, that there's nothing wrong with, with using that um, on any game species. The other thing is they have a lifetime warranty on them. So you run one through an animal, it hits a rock on the way through, you're practicing in sand pits. It doesn't matter. They don't care. Send it to them. They will send you new ones. That's so, cool. That's cool. Yeah. And they don't charge anything extra. It's just, you huh. pay, you know, you, you pay to ship it to them. They will ship it back to you. And so, um, and I guess we didn't talk about prices. The, uh, the, the VPAs, the 175 grain heads, mm-hmm. they are going to come in about 50 bucks for three of them. Okay. Uh, and the DRTs I believe are, I believe they're $35 for three of them. But the thing is with DRT, follow their social media because they are always running 20% off for this reason, 15% off for that reason. So that's, and cool. that's, that's, that's dirt nap gear. Uh, I do have a bunch of those, uh, but however, out of my compound, it's actually not the broadhead I'm going to shoot this year, but we're going to tease that a little bit still. Hold on, hold on. Um, before, before we go there, let's stay yeah, on yeah, price because yeah, yeah. you just, you just, you just brought up price and this is a point okay. I want to cover. My least important factor when selecting a broadhead is how much it costs. So I totally, I totally agree I, to a certain point. I spend thousands of dollars on hunting a year. And I think most hunters probably spend at least a thousand dollars a year on hunting. If they really break it down to your fuel and your cameras and your bow and your camera and all that stuff. And I see so many guys on Facebook they are like, man, Walmart's got these new broadheads on sale for $6 for a four pack. Like that's the thing that's actually going to kill your animal is that broadhead when you're hunting. It's the dumbest thing you can skimp on. Like totally, if, if, totally the, agree. if the broadheads I wanted to shoot cost $200 for a six pack, I'd pay $200 for a six pack. Fortunately they don't, but I know those heads are out there, you know, and I know there's guys that shoot those, but 
price is the least important factor to me, period, when it comes to picking broadheads. Yep, I, I, I generally agree. I will say I generally, for me, won't pay over $50 for the broadheads I want to shoot. Um, not that uh, – it's just that there's there's other going to be other options that'll work just as good. That's yeah, that, sure. that's that's mainly the reason why. Yeah. So, uh, but with with the with, with the um, like the the two blade cut on contact uh, heads, um, you're going to get multiple uses out of them, right? Right. Uh, the the VPA head that I showed you earlier is 100% resharpenable. Like I hunted with them all last year. The one the summer shot her turkey with came out of my quiver. You know, I just dropped it, got it sharp again and and put it put it in her quiver so um you use it over and over and over and over and over and and the drts aren't as durable like that you can sharpen a drt but what i normally do is at the end of the season i send them all back to dirt and add gear and i get a fresh batch that's cool yeah you know so th that's a really great program right um so uh pay a little bit more you can resharpen it all uh, there are other companies that do that. Um, Muzzy, or no, I'm sorry, not Muzzy. Absolutely not Muzzy. <laughs> it's uh, um, Magnus. Magnus. Magnus Anything okay. you, and yeah. Any head you buy from Magnus is a great head. The owner, Mike Soam, is a great guy. Uh, they have a 100% no questions asked, um, you know, re replaceable head. You ding it, you send it to them. They will resharpen your own heads and send them back, um, or they will send you new ones if, if there's too much damage done to them. So, again, you were talking about $50 for a pack of three heads, but um, theoretically, if you spent $150, bucks, you buy three packs, you're always going to have a rotation of sharp run heads. You might, have you. One, you might have two packs at home and one pack in the mail, stuff like that. So, and it, it works really good. It's, it's a really good system. Um, the other thing I want to mention real quick uh, we talked about um, VPA, we talked about DRT, and I just brought up Magnus. They're all 100% American companies and made in America, which you can't say for yours. Absolutely, I can't say it for mine. Nope. So, okay. Um, where, where do we want to go next? Do we, I, 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 I'm rambling, but guys, I'm super passionate about broad ends. I'm a geek for this stuff. He is a geek for this stuff. So, all right. So you talked about your trad stuff. Was there anything else you want to add on compound broadheads? Well, I'm, I, I, um, I'm trying a new one this year that I'm really excited about. My least favorite phrase anyone ever says in hunting, but go ahead. What is it? <laughs> okay. I only say that because uh, I, I haven't shot anything with this head yet. So I don't, okay. I don't know how it works. I okay. know that they fly fantastic. Okay. Okay. And let's be real out of a tuned, properly tuned compound bow, any head on the market should fly fantastic. Okay. Right. Here's your field point accuracy. Field point accuracy is about the person shooting the bow and about the tune of the bow. It has not a lot to do with the broadhead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I yeah, love the yeah. points you're making, by the way, because I'm like writing them down. So I make sure I go back over because you're making all my points for me. You don't even realize it yet. <laughs> okay. it's about to get dirty in a minute. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> uh, so when it comes to the most accurate broadhead that, that I've ever shot, and again, this is a personal, personal preference is this is my new head that I plan on shooting for, um, 2020. And we talked about cut on contact. We talked about, uh, having the weight up front and, and all that. Um, and, and I think this is like the, a good combination of everything. And I'll hold it up to the camera. This is called the Exodus and it's made by QAD, which is quality archery design. Good it company. is a yep. great company. Again, American company. Uh, these are badass. They are shorter profile heads. Okay. And it's got a swept blade design. And what I mean by swept blade design is that the blade design actually, this is a sharp broadhead, so I'm trying not to cut yeah. myself here as I do this on camera, but the, the, the blades actually come back over the shaft of the arrow. So if you actually look at this blade, it's actually the exact same length as your field point. Okay. Right but it is a cut on contact head, but it also has a reinforced, um, they have a special marketing name for this head, but it is, um, it, it, it fly, they fly really, really good. They fly completely silent, which not a lot of broadheads do. Um, there, there's no holes or venting in this broadhead. And you can see even on the DRT, there's holes and venting, right? Yeah. And, 
at, at the higher speeds, some people get whistling with a, with a vented broadhead. Okay, you're not going to get that with a solid um, thing. So I, I'm excited to shoot this. This again is an inch and a half cut. So all three of the broadheads I showed you are the same width. This is a little steeper of a cut. Okay, it's more stubby. It's a, a shorter blade per se, but mm -hmm. but the width is still there. Um, I, I'm excited to shoot these because of you know how. I just I just think it just looks deadly. It's not even like a marketing thing. And I think um, if you look at the DRT, remember I talked about things coming to a point and curling. The yep. DRT, the DRT does come to a point, like a knife edge, right. where that where this ha where the the QED Exodus has a little bit more beef up front. It's more of a rounded um, power tip that I think is uh, is going to be the best of both worlds. Now. The downside to this head, it's not priced because they're 40 bucks for three of them. So they're right in that that's 11, fine, $12. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Yep. They, they have a warranty, of course, against, you know, defects in manufacturership. But if when I shoot this, this is not a head you can sharpen. Okay. I mean, okay. you could, you could, but they're, yep. these are German blades. So it's not all American made. It's German. It's German 0 .040 steel. So real, real good quality, thick steel very sharp out of the package i mean stupid sharp out of the package which is which is nice in nowadays market um so you can't really sharpen these but the the plus side is you can spend i think it's like 11 dollars and get another blade set so they just come apart so earlier we talked about cut on contact and fixed blade this is both right this is a fixed blade broadhead with replaceable blades that is cut on contact so okay. if you're if you're a guy who <laughs> Sharpening your own broadheads seems like there's a barrier to entry. You're not really sure about it. I'm not that guy, you know, but there is something nice to be said for, um, you know, buying the broadheads, buying a couple packs of blades, and you're always going to have razor sharp replacements there ready to go. You're just not going to be able to take that head and sharpen it in the field, you know, but the reality of having to do that and all that often is not that big of a deal. So the sure. QAD, the QAD Exodus is the broadhead I plan on shooting this year. Um, and again, that's 125 grain head. So just like the DRT. So it's 125 grain head and I've got a hundred grain insert. So it's 225 up front and that's way more weight than most guys with compounds are actually running. And I think that's going to be a bad little mamma jamma. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. So all right, I have a question for you before I get to to what I shoot and sure. the parts I want to talk about. But I, yeah, because we're already at an hour. <laughs> are we really? Yeah. Well, we talked about see. Africa. We talked about Africa. Oh Africa. yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, okay. So my question is: is I don't have anything bad to say about any of the heads you pick. I think they all look like good heads. I'm familiar with all the companies. Uh, nothing but good things to say about them. But I said my, my least favorite phrase is I'm going to try something new this year. If, yeah. if what you're shooting is working, why are you trying something new this year? What's your reason no, that, behind it? That's a really great question because I'm, I'm not, um, of course there is the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Right. And obviously I have a friendship with the dirt nap, uh, company. Sure. Um, that being said, I'm always willing to learn. I'm always willing to adapt and I'm always willing to, it can always be better, right? Um, it might not be, but, but, I, but I think it is. I just, I, I met this company. I, I met the QAD rep. I, I've, I've shot the heads. I just like them. They're kind of new. It maybe it's a, a little bit of a, you know, ooh, it's kind of sexy to me because it's yeah. new. Yeah. You know, I'm not immune to that. Um, but what I can tell you is this, when it comes to my compound, I think that um, the ease of swapping out the blades is going to, um, is just the, the time saver versus sharpening or mailing and the DRT to me is, okay. is going to make the difference. How many is, broadheads do you go through in a year that you're worried about sharpening blades? Or do you shoot your broadheads that much? Yes. Okay. Uh, August 1st, I will not shoot a field point. Okay. So August 1st, I will be shooting all broadheads. 
Um, and, and that's mainly because I shoot at, you know, at my Bowman's club, we have a broadhead course where it's silhouette targets going into sand. Uh, okay. Sand piles. So, um, and I think that's more than most people. I oh get, yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Uh, yeah, I get it. It's, it's, it's more, and it's really important for the, when, when I, in a, um, in a trad year, because mm-hmm. just pulling back and everything's about your eyes and what you're looking at, what you're focusing and pulling back and seeing a big metal broadhead on the front is different. It does change the, the peripheral of what you're shooting at. So um, okay. shooting broad, shooting broadheads with your, um, with your trad gear is more important, I would say. Um, yeah. But but um, I, I just I I do I do practice with broadheads, so okay. that that's nine that's nine heads, you know that I'll usually rotate through, and they get dinged up in the sand, and they're pretty yeah, and they're sure. dull as dull could be, and I don't care, yep. I don't care because as soon as October first rolls around, um, but then at that point I usually have six sharp ones and three practice ones, okay, you know, and um, I think I shoot more than most people. I think um, you do too. Yeah, you yeah, definitely shoot but, more than me. <laughs> yeah, but um, so I, I think swapping the blades this year is is what is made the difference to me. And but again, uh, of all the broadheads I've shown you, um, there's definitely broadheads that I've tried that I've not been happy with. Yeah, but we're, I'm, we're not here to bash, you know, or we're not no, here to no. not talk talk about what doesn't work. I can just I I'd rather talk about what does work. And all three of those heads that I showed you absolutely work. Um, two cool. of them, I cool. two of them I would roll on my compound any day, all day. And the other one is my trad head. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, that's good enough answer. That, that answers the question. Um, all right. So let's talk briefly. I'll keep it a lot quicker. So for everybody listening, I am not a arrow building freak. I'm not a, an archery genius. I don't particularly even like going out in my yard and shooting my compound bow. Like it's not the funnest thing in the world for me. I like shooting my recurve. That's pretty fun. But I shoot my compound bow because I have to. Like I have to be proficient with it. I shoot my crossbow, even though it's a cross go- crossbow, like I still want to be proficient with it, know its capabilities and practice different angles and stuff. With my recurve, my, my Adelalo, my new trad bow, it's getting built for me. Like that stuff I'll practice with a lot, but I don't particularly enjoy fiddling with my own arrows, putting it all together and working on different combinations. That's not the fun part of hunting for me. Like I'll shoot it. I'll go to the archery shop you know, support them, have them build something for me. And that's what I'm going to use. The fun part of hunting for me is the chasing the animal part, not the shooting the bow part. So I shoot a bow only because I can't shoot a gun for four months a year. If I could hunt with a rifle for four months a year, like I can a bow, I'd probably rifle hunt all the time. So I just want everybody to understand Billy is much more the archery expert than I am. I wouldn't even call myself an archery expert. I'd call myself a hunting expert and I'm pretty darn good at that. But when it comes to archery, building bows and stuff, Billy's the guy to listen to on that stuff, not me. That said, I've killed a whole lot of stuff with my bow. Um, and my go-to broadhead for a long time now has, has been the Rage. So I started with the Rage Extreme, the two and a third inch cut. And now I'm shooting the Rage Hypodermics at two and a third inch cut. I've shot a lot of different varieties of broadheads. I've shot a lot of fixed blades. Has this giant buck behind me. It's 187 and 5 eighths inch buck that I killed here in Ohio. I killed that with a trophy taker shuttle two lockhead. The great fixed blade head. Yep, absolutely. Wish they don't make them anymore, but wish they did. They great head. Anymore. That's that's. I don't know that I would have switched back to Rage if they wouldn't have stopped making that shuttle T lockhead. Um, they also made another one called the Ulmer Edge, which was the first mechanical that I really played with. Mm-hmm. And I love that head. That Ulmer Edge, I would still say, I think I like it a little bit better than I like my Rage Hypodermics. Yeah. Uh, For those of you that are wondering, it's Ulmer, U-L-M-E-R, uh, after the professional hunter and target shooter, Randy Ulmer. Yeah, Randy Ulmer. Um, so it's an awesome head. Another company now has bought that patent. And we're not bashing broadheads, so we won't even bring that company up. I did try those broadheads out. Uh, the new ones based on that, and they were just horrendous. I uh, had horrible experiences with them for half a year. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just absolute junk. So I, I won't even I won't even recommend that name to, to look at. But um, so I switched back to the Rage Hypodermics because the most important thing for me, you mentioned it, and I'm very glad you did, uh, is any head's going to fly like a field point, or any head's going to fly accurately if you tune your bow properly. We can agree on that. So the biggest thing I'm looking for is wound channel. 
And yeah. in my opinion, and this is, this is me, the, the hunter, not me, the archery guy, my opinion of a broadhead is the only reason you need a broadhead on the end of your arrow is for when you make a bad shot. Because if you shoot a deer at the top of the heart where the aorta comes into the heart, right at the bottom of the lungs, and you take that out with a field point, that deer is going to die in 60 or 70 yards. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's going to happen. But when you start missing that exact spot you're aiming for is when a broadhead comes into play. So for me, I want the biggest cutting diameter that I can get that still flies. me. And for me, that rage hypodermic has, has fit the bill. I've killed upwards of 50 animals with it now and i've never lost a single animal that i've shot with the rage hypodermic not a single one so i can't argue with those results there's a lot of new cool stuff out there i'm not trying anything i know that head works for me and i really like it but i also know what that head's limitations are and, and the limitations are it's a one it's a one shot use i know guys who use them two or three times for me i look at it like a disposable broadhead yep. it's like 45 bucks for a three pack I mean, which is a little more on the spendy side and especially as many as I go through every year between missing and shooting coyotes and whatever else I shoot with them a year. Um, but I look at it as disposable. It's, it's a one shot thing. If I blow through a deer, it, it, it's a one shot go on that broad head. And usually when I pull it out of the dirt, it usually won't close back all the way. And that's most of the time because when I don't, I don't know why I don't have a high speed camera to look at, you know, when the head's getting damaged, my assumption is it's happening when it goes into the dirt and it's getting that hard stop that the blades start to bend and deform a little bit. And that's where I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm hunting a big game animal, like a bison, maybe even an elk, I know a lot of guys who elk hunt with those, but I kind of feel like for an elk, I'm going to go back to a fixed blade head, um, depending on the scenario, but I lean more towards a fixed blade head on a bigger animal. But for whitetail, for black bear, for hog, for mule deer, for antelope, all of which I've killed, with that rage hypodermic, I mean, there, there's nothing better. If you hit, I know one of your favorite people, little Chris Brackett, he, he had a saying, if you hit a deer behind the shoulder. And shoot below, another one. Shoot, yeah, he probably <laughs> said that too. Uh, no, but this is, this is a good, this is a good, good thing. Yeah, to say. Yeah, you know, sorry, and, yeah. and for as much as, as people rag on Chris Brackett, and I'm not saying anything he did was right either. He's one of the best whitetail minds that's been in the industry in the last 20 years. If you want a guy who really knows whitetails and knows how to manage whitetails and kill big whitetails, listen to what that dude says. Whether yeah, you like we, him or not, yeah. doesn't matter. I, I yeah, mean, we, I, I know what you're saying. When you okay. kill extra ones every year without a tag, you get a lot of practice. Well, hey, he's twice as good as as uh, people who just shoot one. But, but no, I, I'm serious. Like, I don't want to take that yeah. away. Wait, let, uh, the guys. Let's go back. Go, let's, let's go back. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let, let's go back to what Brackett said. If you shoot him in the guts, you want to shoot him in the guts with a rage. That, that's so, not what he said. What he said was <laughs> if you shoot them behind a shoulder and below the spine with a rage, with a rage broadhead, you're going to find the deer. I've had the same experience. I hunt enough and I shoot enough animals that I know I rarely hit the exact spot I'm aiming, but it, it's rare that I gut shoot one. I don't gut shoot them that often, but I've gut shot several deer, man. I, I shot one. I think it was three years ago. I was spot and stalk in a bean field on a really nice buck in Ohio and uh, took a 40 yard shot, which I'm very comfortable at. And I hit one little sprig of beans that was sticking up in the bean field and it deflected that arrow. I mean like 10 inches back. The deer was, was, you know, took, yeah, stuff took that jump. Yeah. Stuff happens, man. If you bow hunt long enough, stuff's going to happen. Dude, I shot that deer like two inches in front of the back leg. It was a horrible shot. I know you've seen the pictures of it. But that massive wound channel that, that Rage put in and the arrow that you pass through them, it's stuck in the in a rib on the opposite side. Uh, that deer only went 70 yards, got shot, bedded down, died, which is what most deer are going to do. But I think that giant wound channel that that rage gives you, uh, for me, I'd rather have an extra inch of cutting than I would have fixed blade broadhead when it comes to white tail, black bear, stuff that size. So what is your, uh, and again, this is just going to be, you know, off the top of your head. Uh, what, what do you think is your percentage of pass throughs? 95. Okay. So that's, that's good. Cause I think one of the, the most important things, no matter what broadhead is having is poking two holes. Yeah, for sure. Right. And that's one of my concerns with, um, with, you know, shooting mechanicals is it, it does take energy. It does rob you of momentum to mm -hmm. open those blades. 
Okay, uh, the rear deploying ones are different than the front deploying ones. They, they take different types of, of, of kinetic energy um, to open the blades, and that's where kinetic energy matters. Yep. You know, um, so th that's what I was always, because, you know, I guess all I really have to go off is, is uh, watching, you know, guys shoot stuff on TV, right? Right. And a lot of times with a lot of mechanical shooters on TV, you're watching the deer run away with one hole in it. Yep. Um, you know, thankfully they find, you know, all those deer in, 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 I guess it doesn't really matter when that one hole is three inches or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. Um, I just, I know for, for me, you mentioned something where you said, can we just say real quick how we're not arguing? This is great. I know. Um, kind of disappointed but, uh, a little bit. For me, you had said, you know, you don't care what broadhead costs because it's the one thing that's the most important and whatnot. Yep. And where, where I totally agree with that concept, but then I ask you, why do you, quote unquote, chance it with something mechanical at that extreme moment of importance? Well, because, so for me, I, I'm going back on my results. Like right. there was a point in my hunting career where I was trying stuff. I'm not at the point where I'm trying stuff anymore. Well, I say that and I'm getting ready to go home with an Adel Adel and a stone point for the first <laughs> time. Okay. That's trying stuff. But for what I know works. And again, for my reasoning for hunting, which dude, I'm a trophy hunter. I, we live off deer meat. That's what my family eats, but it's because I kill a lot of bucks every year. It's not because I'm out whacking does. Uh, for me, I know what works and I'm going to stick with that. And a broadhead entry is the only part of hunting I can't replicate somewhere else. Like I don't have deer I can line up in my backyard and shoot through and look at all the different wound channels. Okay. Now I know what a rage two and a third inch cut does to a deer. I'm happy with it. I'm going to leave it alone mm -hmm. with that. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Completely. I think I kind of went off on a tangent. No, I mean, it's It's going to be, yeah, obviously based on, on what you, what you've seen. You know, I've never, I'm, I've never mm -hmm. purchased a mechanical head. I've never anything. Um, your, your question was, why would I chance it? That, that's what yeah, your question was. Yeah. So I don't look at it as a chance because the worst thing that can happen to that rage head is it doesn't open when it goes in the deer. So I, uh, here's one thing I think you and I'll agree with. I will not shoot an over the top, uh, mechanical broadhead, which is where the blades, when they're folded up, the sharp parts pointed into there and it's going to flip right. over itself going through the deer. I won't shoot that. I, the concept just, I can't make it work in my head it doesn't make sense to me, but a rear deploying rage broadhead, even when it's closed, still has like seven, eight inch cut diameter. Now I've never had a small entry wound or a small exit wound on any animal I've ever shot with a rage, but I have seen a couple people who have, and usually that, that head's going to open up once it's inside the animal, but going through even seven, eight inches, man, that's, that's, that's as big as a yeah. lot of what people are shooting fixed broadhead heads now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's like the slick tricks about that. I, I've yep. shot stuff with I've shot stuff with the slick trick, which is it was a good head. Um, I think they might have been an inch, but even I mean, seven yeah. that's an eighth. And seven an inch eighths is, is the legal minimum in most states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. Well, I mean, I, I'm not gonna sit here and like pretend like I'm gonna switch to mechanical heads. I'm, I, I'm right. not. I, no. I, I, I guess what I will ask you: Have you ever not? Do you have any concern about taking like quartering two shots or do you just wait for a different situation? Cause in the reason I'll ask that is because I'm shooting a 125 grain head with a hundred grains up. So that's 275 or hundred, 225 grains coming out of my bow to 60, 270. I don't have like the craziest fastest mm -hmm. bow, you know, but it's a 630 grain overall arrow. If that deer is quartering to me, I'm going to put it right on the shoulder and I'm going through it. Yeah. You know, um, I have no qualms whatsoever. And I would hope that you feel differently with your heads. Um, well, yes and no. One, I, I really don't take quarter and two shots. That's kind of my, that's one of my no-nos in a hunting scenario. The first Boone and Crockett buck I ever shot uh, was a quarter and two shot and I lost that buck. And I, mean, I don't it's not, think, it, it's not ideal. It's, it's, I, it's not ideal. Uh, but what I, I'm saying I, is all the deer I've killed, I've never taken another quarter and two shot. Okay. Deer. I've should, never done it. Okay, me either. Let me rephrase. <laughs> okay. I, I don't pur purposely take them, but sometimes they happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you the, especially the, the, spot and stock, like I like to hunt. Like, you get yeah. quartering two shots all the time. Yeah, like the deer. I mean, elk are different than deer. But um, uh, I've never 
taken a frontal shot on a deer with a bow. I don't think, no, I haven't. Definitely with a firearm I have. But um, so, yeah, I'm just saying I, I would be concerned on the what ifs with a mechanical head. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think, I think you got to go in with the mindset of this is what my equipment's capable of. This is what my equipment's good at. I know my equipment isn't ideal for a quartering two shot on a giant whitetail or a big mule deer. So I'm probably not going to take that shot. Okay. Um, now I will say with my Raven, I shoot the rage hypodermic crossbow head and I shot a mule deer at 42 yards this year, quartering two. And I, I didn't even think about it. I mean, it was no doubt in my mind that was a good shot. Yeah. Well, you know, that bolt is going to be a little heavier than your arrow. It's a, it's a totally you know, different it's, piece of it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. There's, there's more kinetic energy, you know, <laughs> uh, more momentum, whatnot. Yep. Um, short, shorter arrow, stiffer spines, or I should say bolt, but whatever. Um, all right. So, um, of the broadheads that I showed you, which mm -hmm. one would you feel the most comfortable running on your compound this year? You go to the shop and it doesn't have to be the ones I showed you. It doesn't have to be that okay. you go to the shop and you're leaving for a hunt and there, there's just no rage. You're, there's nothing, but you've gone to multiple places. What are you going to put on your arrow? Because I feel the reason I ask this is because I have more options than you. You've got a lot more options than me, but I yeah. stock up on mine, so I don't run into that. But I'll play no, I know, game. I know, I'll but I'm at, I, yeah. yeah. So I really like that DRT head. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I go back to I'm not an archery nut guy, and I don't like tuning my bow. It's not fun for me. I just want it to work right when I pull it back and aim it at something. Uh, I had a really hard time getting the DRT heads to fly good out of my compound. I, okay. I just It was like taping a wiffle ball to the end of my arrow and i i'm willing to say that's a thousand percent me like that's that's totally on me not knowing how to tune the arrow properly we're not caring enough to do it yeah a little bit but i mean the drt does take it does like slower bows and yeah. i know especially when you were shooting your expedition and i believe your bear and those are the two bows i know of you for shooting the last couple of years yep. um they're both really fast bows so yeah. uh, your results don't surprise me Okay. Okay. So if I had to pick one head, the head I'm familiar with that I've killed animals with in the past um, is the G5 Monte. Okay. I've, I've killed deer with that head. I like it. I like the solid construction. If I'm going for a fixed head, it's because I want to shoot through a brick wall. You made, know, in Memphis, that... made in Memphis, Michigan. Okay. Well, G, yeah. G5 is a, you know, prime point, G5. Points so. against it, but yeah, no, no I, uh, yeah, that, that's probably what I'd go with. No, no, it's a great choice. Great choice. The only downside, I, the only, the only bad thing I have to say about them is out of the package, they do require a little bit of work. Yeah. Um, meaning yeah. I have, I've, and I haven't bought them in a few years. So, you know, their QC might've gotten better, but um, I, I've never found a Montec to be sharp enough to my liking. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah Which is not, and it's a three, it's a three blade head. So you literally lay it flat. It's the easiest head in the world. To it's sharpen. the easiest head in the yeah. world to sharpen. So it's not like it's not you know not a big deal. But again, that what's cool about that head is it it's milled. So that means it starts mm -hmm. as a solid piece of metal, and they use like the CNC, the water jets to cut it. I mean that's yeah, pretty. That's cool. I mean it, it's basically like the Remington eight seventy of the broadhead world. Yeah, you know it's the Rev Remington eight seventy. That entire it starts as a big block of metal, and it's that that's why it's the number one shotgun in the world. You know. Um, for durability and you yeah. know, ease of use and stuff like that. So no, great, great choice. Great choice. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So, all right. Uh, is there anything we didn't cover in broadheads? The only thing I would say going back to my, and I'm going to say not something negative, but something you got to watch out for with buying rage broadheads is do not buy them on Amazon unless you a hundred percent know the seller because Hallelujah. yeah half the time you'll get a chinese knockoff in rage packaging that they stole from the factory in china or wherever they make them um i i've done that one time i bought rage heads off amazon and you could pick them up and feel them that they were different than what and i'm familiar with what i'm used to shooting so i was fortunate enough i could tell and i just chucked those things asked for a refund on amazon didn't send them back and they gave it um, if, if they're but, selling you broadheads for four dollars each, or even cheaper than that, there's a reason, people. There's it's reason. not because it's not because of marketing, and they're not the same. Yeah. No, I paid full price though. I paid full price on the rage Ouch. heads in Ouch. rage packaging. Yeah, it was like forty five bucks for a three pack of that rage hypodermic, and I got them, and they were garbage. So I buy them at Bass Pro or Cabela's or Shields or wherever, but I won't buy them off of Amazon again unless I know if I know the seller on Amazon, then fine. 
Um, but don't look for the cheapest deal on a range of broadheads on Amazon. I think you're going to get what you're buying. That that's yeah. where I think a lot of bad experiences come from because when you get a hot product like that, that is a big marketing product. They've got some awesome marketing and they sell a lot of broadheads. But anytime you get something big like that, the Chinese love to knock that stuff off and you're, you're guaranteed you're going to have counterfeits floating out there. I think that's where a lot of bad press for rage comes from some of those counterfeits. I would I'd probably agree with you on that. Uh, you know, the, just the, the, the steel's not going to be the same. The tolerances aren't the same. The set screws. I mean, every, anywhere, they can, anywhere they can scrimp they're going to. And, and if you're buying, the, okay, um, I don't, you know, we're an hour and 15 minutes in the show. I don't want to go on this rant, but I'm going to for a minute. It's a buff if you're, bonus feature. If you're buying those on purpose to save money, just don't listen to our show. I'm <laughs> just, that, why are you doing that? Why are you, you're taking yeah. the money out of an American company. You're, you're stealing from the American uh, packaging designer and yeah, broadheads are expensive because they're feeding a lot of mouths. You know, they're feeding the shipping and the receiving and they're doing it. It's not just about, you know, like, Oh, they pay, you know, the Toskies so much money to shoot. It's not about that. It's about, you know, just have some pride in where you're from in this day and age. And, and yeah, they're expensive and they're expensive because it's the number one thing that's killing the animal. Yep, and they're expensive for a reason. And if you're getting a deal online that's too good to be true, it is. Yep, yep. Don't fall for it. Yeah, and I don't care if you're buying them because you're shooting hogs because you, for some reason, to you, the value of a hog's life is less than a deer. I don't. Yep. Th- that drives me crazy. Yep. It, you know, it's just ugh. anyway. If if you're that hell bent on buying something that's going to last buy a VPA, buy a, a DRT, buy a Magnus, buy something where you buy it once and you just have to ask them for a new one and they give it to you. Yeah. Find a new hobby. If you're worried about dropping 30 bucks every year, hunting's a lot more expensive. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I love seeing guys that are, are in their, you know, their $400 Sitka with their $1,500 Matthews and, you know, and they've got a quiver full of, Walmart Carbon Express arrows with um, Allen head or the Allen, you know, with the N8 yeah. the Allen head, you know, like oh, why, <laughs> why, 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 why? It's, it's like guys, it. that, it's like guys that buy an expensive gun and put a crap scope on it. it. Drives me crazy. Buy a cheap gun and get a good scope. Okay, I'm ranting. I'm done. I'm done. Different but, show, different day. Different show, different day. But anyway, I think we had a, a, a good conversation, and I think at the end of the day, when you really think about it. Uh, everything I said was right. So it's a good day. We had a good time. Well, we, that's a different <laughs> drew, show for a different day. <laughs> I got silence out of them guys. I got silence, <laughs> but no, when it comes down to it, um, everything we mentioned is, it comes from a quality company. Everything we mentioned, uh, I would 100% even the rage. It, for the most part, it's going to do what you need it to do. So, um, you know, just practice with it and go to the woods and kill some stuff. Right on. Couldn't agree more, man. All right. I'm going to let you take us out. All right. We're done. That's it. Have a great week. (laughs) See you guys next week. (laughs) See you guys next week.